This is a typical setting for one of nature's most fascinating dramas. The story is well known, but few people have ever watched it take place from beginning to end. It's the story of frogs. And toads. It begins in the spring with the discovery of tiny eggs floating in the water. At first glance, they seem to be only little specks in a big mass of jelly. But each of those little specks is an egg, and each egg is coated with jelly to protect it from hungry fish and insects. Nestled safely in the shimmering, glistening jelly, the eggs develop within a few days into small, fish-like creatures known as tadpoles, which leave the jelly and swim down beneath the surface of the water. The tadpole is a strange animal. He has a long tail and a smooth, almost transparent skin. But he's not a fish, even though he resembles one. He's an amphibian, an animal that spends the first part of its life underwater and then gradually changes into an air-breathing land animal. Enemies destroy some tadpoles before they ever reach the land animal stage. This monster is an insect larva, scarcely three inches long. Another enemy is the water spider, which carries a bubble of air around its body as it descends beneath the surface of the water in search of food. The tadpole sits quietly, hoping he won't be seen. His only other means of defense would be to try to escape by swimming away. But some of the tadpole's enemies, such as this water snake, are also good swimmers. Watch. The tadpole's life is full for the most part as he stores up food for the dramatic change that will take place. The days are spent resting, swimming gracefully through the water, and feeding the horny ridges on the inside of the mouth to saw away bits of plant life. In breathing, he obtains oxygen from the water, which is gulped in through the mouth and passed over gills inside the head. The gills, which are not visible from the outside, remove the oxygen from the water and then the water flows out through an opening on the side near the back of the head. This opening will disappear when the tadpole changes into a land animal. Many changes must occur before the tadpole will be ready to live on land. Hind legs appear first as barely visible little buds near the base of the tail. As the days pass, these legs continue to grow. It'll be several weeks before they're fully developed, but already significant changes are taking place. Feet and toes are taking shape, and the legs are becoming jointed. They dangle behind the body now, useless, but recognizable as legs. Gradually, these legs fill out and become more sturdy. When they're almost completely developed, front legs push out of the body. The front legs develop inside the body and don't appear until they're ready for use. Still more changes must take place before the tadpole is ready to leave the underwater home he shares with fish and other water creatures. The frilly lips and other fish-like portions of the body are absorbed. The mouth becomes wider. Lungs develop to replace the gills, which would be of no use on land. Then gradually the tail is absorbed. It becomes shorter and shorter until finally it disappears. And the tadpole emerges from the water as an air-breathing land animal a frog or a toad. Now his home is on the bank instead of underwater, but if an enemy approaches, he'll leap back into the water and swim away. He swims by kicking both hind legs at once. But this spadefoot toad is an exception. He kicks one leg at a time. Camouflage is another means of self-protection. Many frogs and toads are able to change color slightly so that they blend in with a background of leaves, mud, or water. Unless you look closely, you might think these green tree toads were part of the foliage of this green plant. A cricket frog sitting right out in the open on the bank of a pond is hard to see because he's almost the same color as the mud. Here's one fellow, though, who isn't depending upon camouflage. This bullfrog found himself a rock to hide under. But since his hiding place has been discovered, he'll have to use some other means of protecting himself. At the slightest touch, a frog will arch its back and inflate its body. This makes it more difficult for anything to swallow him. 
If something touches his eye, he'll draw the eye into his head and cover it with a membrane, a sort of thin, transparent eyelid. He probably also uses this membrane to protect his eye while he's swimming underwater. But a frog or toad doesn't always sit still in the face of danger. He leaps to safety with a mighty spring. He can spring from a sitting position merely by pushing with his hind legs. One kick and he's in the air. He hops and jumps not only to escape enemies, but also to move about on land as he goes in search of food. As a tadpole, he was largely a vegetarian. But now he is able to pursue and capture live insects, worms, and even smaller frogs. He instinctively snaps at almost any small object that moves. It's the movement that attracts his attention. Because frogs and toads eat worms and insects that are harmful to us and our crops, we call them friendly or beneficial animals. Here a tree toad sits perched on a long, slender branch watching as a tiny elm worm inches its way onto a leaf. Elm worms are pests, and that's one less elm worm to damage our trees. The tree toad has not only snared himself a good meal, he's done us a favor. Many frogs and toads have long, sticky tongues, which, unlike our tongues, are attached at the front of the mouth and fold back toward the throat. This tongue is used to capture food and carry it to the mouth. The tongue is lightning fast, even in slow motion. The toad takes aim on an earthworm and, whoops, try again. Whoops again. Now he hits the mark, and apparently it was worth all the effort. In some cases, he has plenty of time to take careful aim. Sometimes he has to be quick. If he captures something which is too large to be swallowed in one bite, he can use his forelegs to guide the food into his mouth. But there's a limit to how large the object can be. This little cricket frog will really have his hands full if he tries to tackle that big earthworm. But apparently he's going to make a try for it. Look out. Here's a leopard frog that's having no difficulty handling an earthworm. He uses his front feet to guide the big worm into his mouth. No wonder the cricket frog had trouble. Look how small he is. No bigger than the end of your thumb. The leopard frog is considerably larger. Compare their size as they sit near each other on the bank of a pond. These are two of the most common of the many different kinds of frogs and toads in this country. Listen to the call of the leopard frog. This is a spadefoot toad. You rarely see one of these because they spend all but a few days of the year underground. Most frogs and toads hibernate in the winter, either underground or underwater, because they are cold-blooded creatures, their body temperature is affected by the weather. But the spadefoot stays underground longer than most of the others. The bullfrog is the largest frog in this country. He's sometimes more than six inches long. This is a woodhouse toad. Frogs and toads are close relatives which have the same life cycle. The call of a toad is a long trill. The beautifully colored tree toad, sometimes called the tree frog, has suction cups on his feet. He can climb trees to hunt for insects and to hide against the green background of the foliage. The tree toad's call is a very short trill. The 
cricket frog is small and sometimes hard to see, but his call is easy to hear. The chorus frog is also very tiny, but he too has a loud voice. Many frogs swell their throats to great size, as they call, and they can sometimes be heard for more than a mile. If you hear frogs and toads calling, stop, look, and listen. For theirs is one of the most interesting stories in nature. <laughs>